This is a video about 6.3.2 in Stein's Elementary Number Theory book, and we're taking a look at the motivation for the elliptic curve method. So the setup, given an integer n, uh, I want to factor it somehow. So we've been looking at different ways uh, to do that. And uh, one way that we looked at used Pollard's p minus 1 method, which assumed that uh, my number n that I want to factor, that it has a prime factor such that p minus 1 is b power smooth. And that b power smooth hypothesis, it kind of gave me something like a foothold in order to obtain what p should look like. And remember, once I obtain a factor p, I could factor the rest of n, kind of all the dominoes fall. So the problem is, though, is that given n and given your b, you might not have a prime factor such that p minus 1 is b power smooth for the b that you're giving. So for example here, let's say b is 20. That's the number that I'm given here. And uh, what I want to do is I want to factor 59, 59. Now, I know the factors are 59 and 101, right? But let's pretend that I didn't know those. So how would I obtain those? So you might try to use the Pollard p minus 1, uh, uh, yeah, to try, try to use Pollard's p minus 1 method. And what that uh, what I'd need there is for p minus 1 to be 20 power smooth. But if we take a look at this, uh, 59 minus 1 is 2 times 29. And uh, let's see, 101 is 4 times, uh, 101 minus 1, sorry, is 4 times 25. So neither one of these numbers are 20 power smooth, right? They both have a prime factor, in this case 29 for 50, 58, and uh, 25 for 100. Those are both bigger than 20, so not be power smooth. Neither one is. So of course, Pollard's p minus 1 method uh, is going to fail. So that's not good. So p minus 1 was not 20 power smooth, but what do we notice? Well, p minus 2 happens to be 20 power smooth. So is there a way that I could still use this b power smooth seemed like it was some kind of a tool that I could use to help me obtain uh, a factorization later on? It seemed pretty powerful. Well, p minus 1 wasn't b power smooth, but p minus 2 is. Can I use this in some way? And uh, that's part of the idea for uh, for what we're going to do here. So is there a good way to use p minus 2 instead, instead of p minus 1? Can I use this information that p minus 2 is 20 power smooth? The answer to that is yes. Um, so I'm going to overly simplify why it's yes. And there's a lot going on in what I'm about to highlight. But the big idea here is we're going to look at what's called Lenstra's ECM, so the elliptic curve method. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace z mod p z star. So that's the group of units mod p. And that's where we were doing computations for Pollard's p minus 1 method. We're going to get rid of that group. Like that group was important for me because that group has order p minus 1. And again, p minus 1 was, was b power smooth. So that's important here. So we're going to get rid of that. And we're going to replace it with a group of points on some elliptic curve E over z mod pz. So it's a pretty big theorem. That's the cardinality or the order. So in this case, because it's a finite group, it's the same thing. Maybe I should just say the order of that group of points of an elliptic curve over z mod pz, it's p plus 1 plus or minus s for some non-negative integer s that is at most, uh, well, less than, strictly less than 2 times the square root of p. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. But what, what can we do here? How can I use the fact that maybe I'm p minus 2 uh, p minus 2 is 20 power smooth. Maybe what I could do is I could find some elliptic curve E whose corresponding group E of z mod pz has an order that is p minus 2 power smooth. So in our case, we're looking at z mod 59z. Maybe I can find an elliptic curve whose, who's, uh, if I know that 57 is 20 power smooth, can I find an elliptic curve whose order is 57? And maybe I could try to finagle Pollard's p minus 1 method and use the smoothness in this uh, elliptic curve group instead of in z mod 59z star. That is, again, an oversimplification that is, should still be you know, pretty hand wavy and confusing, but uh, that is the basic idea of what we're going to do. Now, if I look, for example, here, it's not apparent at all, like, well, what's the elliptic curve that you use? Like, that's part of the problem is trying to find an elliptic curve for which this stuff will work. But for example here, if we look at this one, y squared equals x cubed plus x plus 54, and I'm considering that over z mod 59z, then uh, it's not also readily apparent how to obtain the order of an, a group of points on an elliptic curve, but like Sage could do it, say. So like, how do I actually figure out what this is? Well, like for z mod 59z, for this curve over z mod 59z, you know, we're looking at a bunch of dots. So 59 is pretty small. You could probably count them. And there's 
57 points on that curve. So the order of the group is 57. And we should be happy because like we've said, if, 50, if 59 was P, then 57 is P minus two. And as far as my B, 20 that I'm given, 57 is 20 power smooth. That's pretty cool. So again, that kind of gives me the green light that maybe I could try to factor 59, 59, uh, or yeah, maybe I could try to factor 59, 59 uh, using this curve somehow. It's just suggesting it. And uh, so let's see, this curve has order 57 and we know 57 is 20 power smooth. We just talked about that. All right, so I wanna get into this. So the book just says it is a theorem that the the order of E of the group of elliptic points over some elliptic curve over Z mod PZ is P plus one plus or minus S. I wanna talk a little bit more about what that means. And uh, I'm gonna think of it as it telling me two things here. So it's a pretty big theorem. They give you a reference if you wanna go look at a proof. It's very, very hard mathematics. Um, but of course, that's probably good for you. So go check it out if you're interested. So what does this tell me though? How do I want you to think of it? It tells me that the order of an elliptic curve group over Z mod PZ, it's bounded by P in the following way. The order of the group, it's at least P plus one minus the floor of two times the square root of P. And the order of any group of points on an elliptic curve over Z mod PZ is at most P plus one plus the floor of two times the square root of P. Remember the floor is, uh, what's the biggest integer that's just less than that real number there? So like the floor of pi would be three, for example. So that's one thing that this tells me. And so uh, I'll do a, an example with numbers in a moment. There's a second thing that this theorem tells me, which is actually, uh, if I am able to, I'll highlight it also, every value of S subject to that bound, so S less than two times the square root of P, it occurs. And again, it says you could prove that using complex multiplication theory. Again, outside the scope of what we're doing uh, in this book. But that's important for me. If you took an S, any non-negative integer, so starting at zero up to the floor of two times the square root of P, for each number in that range, P plus one minus such an S to P plus one plus that S, uh, oops, sorry, I went a little bit too far. There is an elliptic curve over Z mod PZ whose group has that order. So it's a little bit like the intermediate value theorem in a way. So that's uh, for every order that's between these two bounds, you should be able to find a group um, you should, for every number that's in between those two bounds in yellow there, you can find a group of points on an elliptic curve that has that order. It's kind of like in the intermediate value theorem, you know, for every Y value between F of A and F of B, you, know, you can find an input C so that, uh, Y is equal to F of C. All right, cool. And so let me give you kind of a concrete example. So for example, I'm talking about prime 59 and, uh, what else? The floor of two times square root of P would be 15. And so what do one and two say, you know, a little bit more concretely? An elliptic curve group over Z mod 59Z, it has to have an order that is at least 59 plus one minus that floor, so 45. So 45 is the smallest order of a group of an elliptic curve over Z mod 59Z, and at most 59 plus one plus 15 equals 75. And so that's the biggest order that an elliptic curve group can have over Z mod 59Z. It's like you can't have an elliptic curve group that has order of 100 if it's over Z mod 59Z. The second thing, just to illustrate what number two up here is telling me, is that if I start with the lowest one from number one, 45, I can find the equation of some elliptic curve, you know, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, uh, whose group, E of Z mod 59Z, where again, it's kind of subtle notation, but it's, it's the group associated to this equation here, that it has order 45, right? And similarly, if I take the next number after 45, that's still between 45 and 75, that'd be 46. I could find some other curve. And again, similar equation. I'm not trying to suggest to you it's the same A and B up here, right? They would obviously be different. But the point is you could find some other elliptic curve uh, whose group has order 46. And I can play this game all the way up to, and including I get to 75. So again, kind of, I can find you a group of points on an elliptic curve uh, that has a partic any particular order between 45 and 75. So that's kind of important for us. It gives us maybe a lot more to play with uh, as far as, uh, you know, places that I could look in order to help me try to factor in. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, take a look at what's the idea for Lenstra's elliptic curve factorization method here. And um, just to start it out, we do kind of a similar thing to Pollard's P minus one method. And so we're gonna try to compute, and maybe I should also say here, we're given an integer n and a bound b, 
All right, so we're given both of those. And the goal is to try to factor n. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this b like we did before, where I'm gonna compute what's the least common multiple of all the numbers from one up to b, all the integers from one up to b. I'm gonna call that m. So here's the new thing. The new thing is uh, I'm going to pick a random elliptic curve. So what we'll do is we will choose a random element of z mod nz, such that though, 4aq plus 27 is in the group of units mod z mod nz star. And uh, maybe one way to think about that, I'm really trying to say, one way to say that is that 4aq plus 27 is really relatively prime to n, is I think another way that you could think about that. But uh, why, why am I doing that? Like what's the point of this? That'll guarantee that the point 0, 1, a pretty nice point to work with, that it's a point on the particular elliptic curve x cubed, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus one. So that I hope that you see that this a, if it satisfies this, zero one will be on this curve and that's where that a is being used over z mod nz. Now, uh, what do we do with it then? So like what we've just done is we've established kind of a setting about where are we gonna look for some kind of, where we're gonna do some work at to try to factor n somehow. So we're gonna work over the elliptic curve, uh, this elliptic curve group for that equation over z mod nc. What we'll try to do is I'm going to take this m that's the least common multiple of you know one to b, and I'm going to try to add p to itself. P is the point zero one, but again zero one over this in this elliptic curve group. I'm going to add it to itself m times. And uh, what is going to happen? And so I know that adding points on an elliptic curve is hard, right? There's kind of a geometric interpretation of it. Um, probably pretty comfortable using Sage to do it. If you've, if you've watched the videos on that, I recommend using software to do it. It's a little bit easier. Uh, anyway, though, at some point, though, it might be the case that I cannot compute the sum of the points. So maybe I'm like adding P to itself a bunch of times. There might be a point where I can't do it anymore. And uh, why am I might not be able to do it anymore? Because maybe one of the denominators in that algorithm isn't relatively prime to my N. Well, in that case, then, if it's not relatively prime to N, uh, then that means that the greatest common divisor of whatever that denominator is with n is non-trivial. And that's great because that means that you found a factor of n. And in that case, I want the algorithm to uh, output fail, or, or I guess actually, sorry. In that case, I found a non-trivial divisor and I'd output it. And therefore, I've got to start at how n should factor. And again, once you obtain one factor of n, like you could divide n and then now repeat the process for that smaller number. And you can kind of see how like you do that more and more, the you know, computations get smaller, they get easier and easier for the computer to do. Otherwise though, um, otherwise you output fail. And we don't want that to happen, but maybe it can. Okay, so let's go down and we'll look uh, maybe at a particular example down here. So for simplicity in the textbook in the example, they look at this elliptic curve. Again, we're looking at uh, just a x here and just a one here. That's what they mean by for simplicity. And uh, it's got zero one already on it. And I wanna factor 59, 59 using the elliptic curve method now. And so what we're gonna do is uh, also maybe I should say using the elliptic curve method and I should also establish, usually in like a homework problem, say, right, and you're like in a very confined setting, controlled setting is what I mean by that, um, you're given a B, right? We're told we're supposed to be 20 power smooth. But in, you know, out there in the wild, maybe you adjust B and see if you can get stuff to work. Anyway, let's say B is 20. So why do I know, why I'm going to use that to follow along in the book? Well, I'm going to compute the least common multiple of the numbers 1 through 20. I'll call that M. And it happens to be this big number here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna write it in binary. And so this little two subscript here, that's just to denote we're writing it in binary. And just to remind you about uh, what does this mean here? Remember, these are all kind of like placeholders for powers of two that like I would add together. So like, um, these are the exponents on two. And uh, um, the next thing we'll do, so that was kind of step one in my algorithm to figure out what this is. It'll be a little clearer in a minute while we're going to think about binary. But then we move on to step two, which is we pick an A at random. And I'll pick 1201. And so I use that 1201 to consider this elliptic curve. So the equation of this elliptic curve over Z mod NZ. And what we want to do now is I'm going to take the point 0, 1, 
0, 1 is p, and it's a point on this curve. And what I want to do is I want to compute what is m times p. So I want to try to compute what is m times 0, 1. So m p, what is it? And remember, like, you know, depending on what your curve is, m times p on one curve is going to be different than m times p on some other curve. So this equation, this 1201, is very important. Okay. But again, it's very subtle that's important because the actual computation, you don't really see it. You know, like usually people use technology in order to do computations on an elliptic curve. But anyway, though, what we're going to look at is um, what is m times p should be a little bit easier for the computer to do is what if I rewrote m in binary? So as a sum of powers of 2, and now you see like what are the non-trivial powers of 2 that I need? Well, for this number here, I look at the binary representation, and what I've tried to do is try to highlight, you know, where are like the non-trivial uh, powers of two. So I see I need like two to the fourth, two to the fifth, two to the sixth, two to the seventh, and two to the eighth, and those are the slots that these reds are in. So if you kind of count, right, this is the zero slot, one, two, three, four. So that's the fourth slot, that's the five slot. So I hope you see how that works. And then you see there's a bunch of zeros until again I get to the thirteenth slot, and that's again the number that's highlighted here. So those are the powers on 2 that I'm really going to multiply p by and add them all together here. Okie dokie. And uh, in that case, again, doing stuff in binary just makes it easier for the computer to do. In this case, though, uh, this example, it tells me that that A1201, which remember you pick it at random, so there's a chance maybe it won't work. And in that case, uh, it won't work because it turns out that along the way, all the numbers are co-primed to 5959. So... What do you do then? Well, you just pick a different A. So if we're following along in this example, so let me get rid of some of this stuff here. If we're following along in this example, now we're to, let's pick a different A, let's say 389. And remember like um, 389, there are some conditions on 389. Uh, it has to satisfy in order to make sure we're playing with a curve that'll have this point zero one on it. 389, it's still random, but we still check that it satisfies this condition here. All right, but it does. And so uh, what are we going to do? At some point, I'm just going to compute m times p again. And at some point, when I'm adding p to itself a whole bunch of times, I end up having to add this point plus this point q right here. So at some point along, yeah, somewhere along that computation, I have to add these two together, right? That's some multiple of p times another multiple of p. And when I look at the group law, remember you might remember how that kind of works, where well, I look at the slope of the line that connects the two points, and that helps me define the coordinate of a third point um, on the line where these two intersect, and I do some kind of reflecting. And again, very vague, very complicated to understand. But what I just want to notice here is that when I compute x1 minus x2 for this point P and this point Q, we end up getting 1414. But when I look at the greatest common divisor of 1414 and 5959, you get 101. So in that case, these two things, they have a common divisor, right? You just found 101 is a divisor of 5959. In other words, uh, what happened here, I would tell the computer, the computer would catch this, all right? It's kind of like you're, you're dividing by zero here. This is, this is not an 1414 on the denominator here, like this is where 1414 is. Uh, that's not an invertible element. It's not a member of this group. And so that's where we'd get like a zero division error. And so that's good for us. It's like a weird case where a zero division error is good for us. That tells us though, that uh, we've got a common divisor for this denominator in 5959, which is 101. And so we would stop then. So how would you actually do this, you know, in practice maybe? What's, what's Lenstra's ECM method look like? And so it's this bit of sage code here. And um, the main thing that I want to point out is you see highlighted in green for the di zero division error. Um, it's changed in Python 3. Replace that comma with the word as, and it should work. Um, if you just copy paste this code, it should work uh, as set. And again, just to see before you set some kind of randomness here, like set random seed to two, and then go ahead and call the elliptic curve method here. And again, to just make sure the stuff we did by hand actually matches what Sage should do, you see that you get uh, 101.